Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Brennan, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, just very quickly moving through some of my disclosures. Um, what I'd like to start off with is some context that up to 100 million Americans are living with ongoing pain of some type. And this really impacts all of us, whether it's us right now or someone in our family, but we're all going to experience chronic pain at some point in our lives if we're lucky enough to live long enough. Um, so this is a tremendous societal burden. It's a tremendous burden to the individual and the family, and it's costly. Chronic pain costs the US economy $635 billion annually, and that's in terms of direct medical costs and also lost productivity. Now I'd like to read the definition of pain here from the International Association for the Study of Pain as a noxious sensory and emotional experience. And really put forward a basic concept that we're failing to treat pain comprehensively, that we're very much focused on the sensory dimensions of pain and not the whole person who has pain, and that this is operating to the detriment of people and society in general, where we see reduced response to the treatments that we are providing people. Now, pain, of course, is a product of the central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cord. And it turns out that pain is influenced by a multitude of modifiable psychosocial factors. And so that if we target some of these factors, we can help people get improvements in their pain and also the impacts of pain, help them live better and do more. And so ultimately what we really need to be bringing forward is a biopsychosocial um, approach to treating pain. And this is really critical so that we're delivering whole person pain care. And this is where virtual reality has the opportunity um, to truly come into the forefront and help medical um, systems deliver this whole person care um, economically and also in a scalable and efficient way. Now, pain is naturally distressing and it communicates to each and every one of us a need to escape whatever is causing the pain, um, to, cause, to escape whatever threat is um, in the environment. And this, of course, is very actionable and pain is escapable in many circumstances, acute pain if we touch a hot stove or if we step on a sharp object. We can readily escape that. Um, but once we have chronic pain, we're not able to readily escape what is causing the pain because it's an underlying medical diagnosis. Often it could be a degenerative condition. And yet that harm alarm will be ringing, distressing signals, prompting and motivating escape behaviors, um, really eliciting anxiety and fear and a whole cascade of normal responses that become unhelpful over time. And they're unhelpful specifically because they serve to amplify pain and they promote neural patterns that actually undermine treatment response for pain. So this is an example of a gentleman who's having a response to his pain. There's nothing I can do about it. I know it's only gonna get worse. Distressing thoughts, of course, are natural in the context of pain, but if we don't address a persistent pattern of distressing cognition and emotion in response to pain, we see that it leads to a whole host of negative outcomes. So poor cognition and emotion regulation essentially undermines descending modulation of pain. And we see that um, it's, it leads to this whole host of persistence of pain and behaviors that are unhelpful and undesirable. Um, myself and colleagues at Stanford University have examined the impacts of some of these negative cognition and emotion patterns and we see that they um, lead to persistent changes in the functioning of the brain, which over time leads a person to have altered connectivity that essentially primes the nervous system for future pain. So essentially, if we're having some of these negative cognition and emotion patterns, we are in training negative and unhelpful patterns that end up working against us and facilitating pain. So this is really the opportunity for us to focus on enhancing descending modulation 
information by connecting patients with the information of pain neuroscience information and also uh, evidence-based skills to improve self-regulation of pain. Because we're all born with a motivation to escape pain, but we're not born with the understanding of how to modulate pain and the distress that it causes us. And this really must be learned. Traditionally, we teach these types of um, skills and information in in-person settings um, individually and within the context of groups. In these settings, people acquire uh, these evidence-based self-regulatory skills where they learn how to calm the nervous system, both cognitively, emotionally, and also to decrease physiological hyperarousal that naturally arises in the context of pain. We can help individuals gain specific skills so that they're focusing more on what they can do to help themselves within the context of pain rather than being focused on the distressing elements of pain. And this is typically taught with a form of treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's multi-session treatment. Um, we see that it's not only effective um, treatment for pain, but that it's also been shown to alter the functioning and the very structure of pain, or, I'm sorry, uh, the very structure of the brain, and that this is important information that we need to get our patients living with chronic pain across the United States access to this evidence-based treatment so that they can optimize neural functioning and have better control over their pain experience. But of course, we see that there's a whole host of barriers to these multi-session cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness-based stress reduction. And even more than ever now with COVID, we are unable to get groups of people together in one place in one room. Um, and so while researchers have put forward, we need to investigate all of these online and digital therapies. We really need to be looking to implementation, broad implementation now in this regard. Um, now, in terms of virtual reality for pain, I'm just briefly going to touch on this because um, my uh, the speakers who came before me and Dr. Lewis in particular really touched on the evidence for VR for pain and it's the evidence base is really strongest for procedural pain and also acute pain. Um, Brennan Spiegel and um, Brandon Burkhead, they have uh, had this lovely study looking at VR in hospitalized patients and demonstrating substantial efficacy for pain control in these time-limited situations. Um, when we look at the literature for virtual reality for chronic pain conditions, we've seen that the majority is really focusing on rehabilitation, movement, and Cinematic training. And so there's sort of an integrated approach um, between education, but also movement of the body. And this is a tremendously exciting and important, and yet it's distinct from where we need to be headed purely from this social into the hands of millions of Americans, key information on how to best self-regulate the sensory um, and emotional dimensions of the pain experience. So this is what we have been focusing on. Um, myself and colleagues and Applied VR as a company, we aimed to translate these evidence-based self-regulatory skills as well as pain neuroscience education into the VR headset and then deploy the headsets nationally in a virtual randomized controlled trial to be able to study both feasibility of the treatment delivered in this way and also to test preliminary efficacy um, for a skills-based virtual reality program. So this was a study that was conducted in 97 adults with chronic back pain or fibromyalgia. And what we were testing was um, a 21-day skills-based virtual reality. 
compared to an audio only version of the treatment. So I just want to draw your attention to the fact that this was a really rigorous study because we were not comparing VR to placebo or um, to you know any any type of a, a low ball control. We were comparing the same treatment um, as VR, but in audio only format. And what that allowed us to do was to isolate the immersive elements of VR that occur through this visual experience. And so what you can see here is that the program includes um, CBT-based skills, um, diaphragmatic breathing, co some cognition and emotion regulation. Um, these, this information is delivered through a variety of different modules. And there's mindfulness principles as well. Um, let me see if we can get the video going here. And so this is a demonstration of one of, uh, actually, a couple of the different scenes that you see. This one, the educational component, where we're able to um, entrain people on the, um, the knowledge of how pain operates in the central nervous system, why these skills and information are important and applicable to them. In some of these new modules, we have um, uh, we have dynamic elements, they're interactive, and so it's essentially real-time biofeedback with the participant where um, they're able to visualize the particles of their breath in the environment and use that as cues for how to alter their own respiratory rate to be able to facilitate a deeper experience of the relaxation response while we are layering on messages about how these skills are applicable not only to just pain, but how they're applicable outside of the headset. Because our goal, of course, is to help people translate this information um, to have a durable result, number one, and then number two, to be able to translate these skills independently into their daily lives for long-lasting pain relief. So this being um, our first study, we um, examined data for the two groups. This is the randomized controlled study. And we ex uh, examined post-treatment data at day 21 after this three-week program and found substantial reductions for pain intensity um, uh, for the VR compared to the audio only. So we are seeing superiority for um, virtual reality um, as well as for um, pain-related interference. And we found similar effects for mood, stress, and for sleep. Um, importantly, these reductions in symptomatology were found to be clinically meaningful. And so the next step in this research, um, we are now just getting ready to launch um, a new study of an enhanced program that um, includes even more of these principles and skills. And we're doing a second virtual randomized controlled trial and a national sample of people with chronic pain. Um, this is just about to go live. So look for that um, to be live in the, just in the next week or two. And um, we're really excited to be able to not only examine this in closer detail, but to examine these associations for a longer period of time so that we can better test the durability um, of effects. So that is where we are Headed now, and I just want to say, um, close out by saying that virtual reality for chronic pain is exciting because we have the ability to provide um, Americans with a scalable, efficient, and effective method of enhanced self-regulation um, of chronic pain. We're able to address the full definition of pain and importantly, engage patients as active participants in their pain care so, so that they have better control over their experience and ultimately better outcomes. Um, so with that, I will just say thank you and back to you, Brennan.